hello everybody. Uh, as Catherine says, I'm going to talk about um, the food system and uh, links between the food system and the built environment and construction generally, uh, with a, a, certainly a focus on some of the impacts of the food system globally. So we'll start off thinking about the Sustainable Development Goals. I imagine that uh, most of you are familiar with them. And it may well be that the one which springs to mind most obviously when we're talking about the food system is zero hunger on the grounds that the food system clearly exists to provide people with food and therefore to prevent hunger. But of course, the food system doesn't exist in isolation as far as the SDGs are concerned. And there are a number of facets in terms of uh, the impact of the food system and impact on the food system. So we can see around the uh, around the periphery of the SDG2 tile, um, the economic environment and individual and societal components of the food system, they don't necessarily link directly to the other SDG tiles I've got surrounding it. But clearly the food system is impacted by climate change. It has a direct impact on the environment of which it's a part. Food for people has an impact on their health and well-being. The responsible consumption of production and food, and we'll come back to that later on, is, is potentially problematic. It employs lots of people in the UK and beyond. And in fact, in terms of smallholder for farm, farmers uh, in developing economies, many of them are women. So it contributes towards reduced inequalities in society uh, more generally, but specifically gender equality. Well, I haven't got that tile on the screen. And education about the food system, I guess, is, is part of what we're talking about today. Now we'll start by thinking about risks to the, the global economic system. Um, this organization, the World Economic Forum meets every year. It brings together governments and uh, non-governmental organizations, businesses, some celebrities, and they debate issues impacting on the, uh, the world's economy. And part of what they do is to come up annually with an assessment of the key risks which affect the world economy and you can see there from the 2021 assessment the top five in terms of likelihood in the top row and impact in the bottom row and the color coding means something they have five different um, categories of risk which are included in their annual assessment green i think you can probably infer quite readily relates to the environment red is societal and obviously the infectious disease in question there is covid19 the amber colour is for geopolitical issues. Weapons of mass destruction have featured there for a number of years. And two which do not feature in the top five in 2021. They use a purple colour for technological risk and use a pale blue colour for economic risk. And most businesses would typically think about uh, standard economic risks to their, uh, their ability to operate. But in fact, the risks which were identified in 2021 are dominated by climate um, issues around extreme weather and the failure of society to uh, appropriately address the risks associated with, uh, with climate change. Damage the environment caused by human activities and that relates quite, uh, quite closely to biodiversity loss. And think in terms of the wildfires we've seen in Australia and California and elsewhere as being a, a, an outcome of human environmental damage. The natural resource crises in terms of extraction of, uh, of resources from the environment, whether that's associated with palm oil or other things. So the environment features strongly. And in fact, the food system is clearly going to be significantly impacted by some of those topics. And we'll cover some of those in a little more detail in the coming slides. Going a bit further than that, when people who do the kind of job that I do, people who work in sustainability, for a career. Uh, this is a, a, some work that was conducted by, uh, not by me, but by a consultancy called Globescan. They took respondents to the, uh, the kind of question that they ask routinely, which is, which of the sustainable development goals do you think is the most important? And this is across a number of years, as you can see in the text at the top. And climate action wins out drastically in terms of the, uh, the area which is deemed to be most important. And then there's a cluster of them around the 20% mark, which includes life on land. And if we relate those back to those risks that were identified by the uh, World Economic Forum, 
the ones which were in the top five in terms of likelihood and or impact clearly relate directly to those two SDGs. Climate action impacting on whether the, uh, the weather as it stands at the moment or our failure to respond to further climate change or the environmental impact in terms of life on land. Of course, it also impacts life below water, although regularly that comes out rather lower in, uh, in these assessments. The damage caused to the environment by people, natural resource crises, or one specific area of damage, which is biodiversity loss. We are at the moment, as, uh, as you may be aware, in what's called the sixth great extinction in terms of uh, geological time. This one caused by human activities rather than by uh, natural processes. And the type of thing that you see in terms of, uh, of, of extremes of weather, here's an example about the extreme rain and, and an analysis conducted by a global consultancy called McKinsey, looking at the increased likelihood of flood events, in this case in Tokyo, I'm deliberately choosing to illustrate the global nature of this. So you can see that in, in Tokyo, there's a massive increase in the likelihood of, of floods, events that they're calling one in a hundred year rainfalls, which of course are no longer one in a hundred year events. And the damage and the, the cost that arises from that and the increase from today up to 2050. At the other end of the scale, again, another part of the world here, if you compare the two uh, images on the left and the right, the darker red in uh, Southern California, Texas and Florida, showing the number of days of, of, uh, of temperatures above 34 degrees compared to the period of 1986 to 2005. When you compare that to human body temperature, that means that the outside temperature is, is close to or above human body temperature, which is clearly a very challenging thing and a challenging environment for people to live in, but of course a challenging environment for the natural world as well. But of course it happens in the UK and you can see in these two images on the left hand side going back to 2012, so about nine or just over nine years ago now in fact, looking at areas of the country which were in drought conditions, so pretty much all of England south of, uh, of Yorkshire and uh, Manchester and large parts of, uh, of the southwest at the time were, uh, were, were extremely dry but a couple of years later, 2014, the image on the right, this is part of the, the southwest of England, extremely wet as a result of flooding. And if you're a farmer, you're not going to be able to grow crops in those fields, not just when they're flooded, but they're likely to kill any crops that were planted in the fields which get flooded. So a significant impact on the food system as a consequence of, uh, of climate change. So what the food system exists to do is to feed the world. And what we've got here is some charts which were put together by National Geographic looking at the available kilocalories or calories, the, the food availability across a number of illustrative countries in 1961 and then 50 years later, the 50th anniversary of the magazine. And in 1961, you can see in the UK, we consumed on average 3,231 calories per day and we see the figures for the world, India and Somalia. And then 50 years later, the UK's consumption had increased by a little bit less than 200 calories today, per day. The total consumption in the world had gone up from just below 2,200 to nearly 2,900. India's consumption had gone up by 450, but Somalia's had actually gone down. Somalia suffered from um, political instability and, uh, and war over a large part of that time. And you can see the impact that's had. But in India, which is still uh, in 2011, was still a, a not largely developed country, certainly in rural areas. Even there, the calorific intake had gone up compared to 1961 and was in fact above the global average from 1961. So the food system has been producing enough food to keep the world, at least in calorific terms, to keep the world fed. But at a cost. And this is uh, referring back to, uh, to Catherine's opening remarks here. As you can see on the images, the food system globally is responsible for some significant environmental impact, 80% of global deforestation. People very often think of that in the context of palm oil, but in fact, the biggest cause of deforestation globally is to produce pasture for cattle. So uh, beef and dairy are much more important than palm oil in terms of causes of deforestation. The release of greenhouse gases, now that arises directly from carbon dioxide from the, the combustion of, uh, of fuels, 
but also within the agricultural part of the food system when you plow the land you can disturb the soil and that can result in the release of uh, nitrous oxide which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide also if fertilizer is applied to crops that can also break down and release nitrous oxide Although the figure in the UK is much, much smaller at only a few percent, globally 70% of available fresh water is used in agriculture to, uh, to feed the, the human population of the world. 70% of biodiversity loss arises from the food system, principally through um, land use change. So where a, uh, a rainforest is cut down to provide pasture for cattle, you go from a hugely biodiverse ecosystem down to essentially a monoculture uh, which includes grass and then cows grazing on it. Freshwater biodiversity loss is similarly impacted and there's been a lot of coverage recently about the damage caused to the seabed by uh, trawling and um, some of you may be aware of a, of a film called Seaspiracy. I think to be read with a bit of, uh, to be viewed sorry with a bit of caution but there's certainly some value in it. And not only does, um, does trawling uh, damage the seabed and damage biodiversity and, and kill non-fish uh, organisms, it also results in the release of, of carbon dioxide and methane from the seabed. And then finally, as if all that wasn't enough, not only does the conversion of natural lands to agricultural land cause all of the, the damage in those first five statistics, but in fact globally over half of all agricultural land is recognised as being degraded largely as a consequence of, uh, of inadequate organic matter in the soil. And that can then lead to, uh, to further loss in terms of topsoil being blown away and lost. Sometimes that is, is lost and clogs um, water courses as well with further impacts on freshwater biodiversity and uh, similarly in, uh, in marine systems as well. And to add insult to injury, around one third of the food which we produce globally doesn't make it as far as a human stomach. We are all used in the West to seeing displays in shops like the one on the left there, lots of food available. Around one third globally of food is wasted, but actually for fresh fruit and vegetables, that figure is rather larger, maybe as high as 45% of all fruit and vegetables which are grown. The loss of food has a direct impact, not just commercially and in terms of human health, but also as um, the material breaks down, it can cause release of methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. So all the resources which were consumed in the production of the food in the first place may actually then lead to further climate change. And if we think back to the risks identified by the World Economic Forum in an earlier slide, you have a rather unpleasant negative feedback loop there. Looking at the impact of um, how that occurs in different types of economy, this is from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, which this is now focusing specifically on fruit and vegetable waste. <clears throat> and there's a significant difference in the, uh, the waste profile between developed economies such as ours in Europe and developing economies such as those in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see a big difference between those two charts. The consumption phase is primarily where we see the loss of fruit and vegetables in Europe. Lots of people buy enough fruit and veg to constitute five a day in their diet, or indeed seven a day, as we're recommended to consume, but fewer people actually manage to eat it. And much of that loss, therefore, is in people's refrigerators in the home or on plates where people don't finish portions of food which are served. It's a very different picture in Sub-Saharan Africa where people don't have the disposable income that most of us enjoy in the West. And so there's much less waste at the consumption phase. There's a significantly larger amount of waste associated with post-harvest processing and distribution, which is a consequence of a much less developed infrastructure than we enjoy in Western economies. Which brings us back to building and how, uh, how the built environment plays a part and helps here. If you imagine the infrastructure that's required to support the food system, from primary agriculture it then material then needs to be transported from farms within the same country or the same continent there's then long distance transport potentially by ship so those of you who go to supermarkets in the uk may be familiar 
with the source of fun, some foodstuffs being from a very long way away, apples and lamb coming from New Zealand, which is literally on the other side of the world. There may be interim storage for commodity products like grain. So you need a built environment to uh, allow for grain silos and storage and sometimes um, some kind of pre-processing. Then shipment to wherever the food processor is and the factories themselves have to be built and maintained and the infrastructure that supplies services and utilities to them. Further transportation, these are expressed as ships, but of course, in many cases, this would be land transport. And the environmental impact of land transport per tonne shipped is typically significantly higher, at least in carbon terms, than surface transport by ship. So manufacturing or packing or in some way finishing the product, which then travels again to a distributor, some kind of warehousing operation. So you will have as well as factories, you'll have warehouses and distribution centers. And then in this case, we're, uh, we're assuming it travels by truck to a retailer, to a shop and then is transported, not by a truck, but by a car typically from the, uh, from the shop to the consumer's kitchen. Although, of course, during the course of the COVID pandemic, we've seen an awful lot more in the way of home deliveries. So that last stage could potentially be undertaken by a delivery van from a supermarket. So all the way along the food chain, you've got infrastructure and the difference in development of that infrastructure accounts for the difference in waste profiles of fresh fruit and veg between a country, a country like ours and sub-Saharan Africa. But there's also a place for innovation. <clears throat> the, uh, the image on the left hand side is a vertical farm where in this case uh, green vegetables, chilies are being grown um, indoors. Now that has a number of impacts. Firstly, as you can imagine, it protects them from the impacts of weather and, uh, and global warming events uh, and extreme weather. Secondly, because they are contained, it prevents a risk of pest damage and contamination. So more of the product can be harvested. And in fact, it needs less processing. Some of what happens with uh, fresh fruit and vegetables is to wash them and remove insects or pests. And if crops are grown in the open field, then particularly heavy rain can splash mud and soil onto the, uh, onto the product itself, which results potentially in, um, in consumer rejection or genuine quality loss. And then more generally on the right hand side, factory automation, so-called manufacturing 4.0, industry 4.0, looking at involving um, much more sophisticated technologies. And of course, all of these um, facilities need construction and maintenance. It's different to a field and it's different to the old style processing that we're used to in the food sector. The left hand image um, is, uh, is indicative of a, of, a, of a growing part of the food sector now, indoor growing, which potentially also can bring fresh food closer to people. One of the potential impacts of the, uh, of the pandemic is that we'll see fewer um, people congregated together in large numbers in office blocks or other workplaces. And that then provides an opportunity for some of those locations, if not even the buildings themselves, to be repurposed to play a bigger part in food production and processing closer to where people are then occupying city centres for, uh, for living rather than just for working. So in summary, delivering zero hunger, if we think about the, uh, the differential rates of waste that uh, I showed in, uh, in developed economies and developing economies, SDG 10 looking at reducing the differences within and between societies, improved access for, uh, for people in poorer countries to the food which is produced. More responsible consumption, particularly by those of us in the West who in, in large part are able to afford to waste food. And then innovation and delivery of improved infrastructure, which protects the food that there is and prevents it spoiling and being lost in the movement from farm to, uh, to, to consumption and potentially even replacing traditional farms in some cases with new types of, uh, of structures where food can be grown in turn indoors and protected better in the process. Thank you for your attention and I will uh, hand back to Catherine. Hi there, thank you so much, Gavin. That was just amazing. Um, I have questions and I'm sure everybody else does too. So please audience, put your questions into the Q&A and I will put those to Gavin right now. Um, I will ask, can I just ask you a little bit about how you came to be doing this? What's your 
background? What brought you into this world? That's a very good question. And, and, and given that there are going to be people listening to this who are looking for career advice, I don't know I can necessarily provide very helpful career advice. I've ended up where I am because it's an area which I enjoy, and which I care about and happens to suit my skill set. Um, I didn't work in food from the outset in my career. I, I trained and, and was educated initially in chemistry. I'm a PhD chemist and I initially worked in the chemical industry. Um, I got involved in supply chain within the chemical sector and took those skills to supply chain within food. And I've been a number of general management roles in my time in food, which has given me, I suppose, wider exposure than many people would necessarily have. And my scientific background, I suppose, again, assists in the, the understanding of sustainability issues and, and how they can be addressed. So I didn't set out to get where I am now, but I, 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 I accreted the skills along the way that, uh, that make me a credible sustainability consultant. And I would argue that that's fantastic career advice. I know that it was something that Phoebe yeah. mentioned earlier on today that actually you don't necessarily have to come directly into things for the young people who are watching this right now. I, I know it's easy for all of us to be saying this, but we, we were all your age at one time or another and, and we didn't necessarily know exactly what we wanted to do. We didn't necessarily come at it in a straight line. It's taken us a little bit of a journey to get here. And actually, I, I would argue that that makes people more valuable um, or, or at least as valuable um, because you bring with you all sorts of other knowledge and, and advice. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the organisation that you run, Gavin, and the kind of clients that maybe you help and work with? Appreciate some of that might be confidential. Sure. Well, I won't name anybody, but I'll, I'll talk broadly. Um, the, the kind of thing I typically do is to work with companies to help them adopt um, environmental, social and governance or sustainability more broadly concerns into their commercial strategies. Now, as I think I brought out during the, the slides in that presentation, there are some significant indeed existential risks to some companies, particularly in the food sector, associated with the impacts of, of climate change uh, and some of the other challenges which we're facing at the moment. And it's helping companies realize that that is something which is of relevance to their stakeholders, whether it's investors or consumers or other stakeholders. Uh, the kinds of things I've done recently, I'm, I'm currently working on um, a, a benchmarking exercise for an organization in the uh, construction sector. I've recently conducted a life cycle assessment exercise in the chemical sector. I mentioned I'm a I'm a qualified chemist. That's probably the first time in my entire career that's been directly relevant to a job that I've done. I've done some work with a, um, uh, an international development charity looking at their carbon profile and how they could reduce their environmental footprint. Um, those, that gives you a flavour, I guess, of things I've been doing recently. Very interesting and really, really diverse. I think that's, yeah. that's certainly what, what comes across um, in what you're saying. Um, Obviously, there were there were a number of things in your presentation, particularly the priority list of um, where people felt the SDGs needed to have the heaviest focus. And, yeah. and understandably, climate action was right at the top there. But very interested to see that um, infrastructure and sustainable cities and things was actually right at the bottom. And, and I know that the whole thing is all interconnected, but it, it may be interesting, certainly for me, that that people had put that so much lower as priority. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, it, that's that's an amalgamation, <coughs> excuse me, of the views of a lot of people over over a period of time from a lot of places around the world. But I think this this is really it, it speaks to the um, it's kind of like steering the oil tanker. It, it speaks to not just the need for change, but the speed with which change can be affected. So if we're going to change the built environment in the UK, we have to change literally millions of buildings. So we can change policy on climate, perhaps without changing some of those buildings. So I think it, it's probably about the, um, the, the, the speed of response that's required, but simply saying that we need to address climate change doesn't actually tell you how you're going to set about doing it. And the nature of the SDGs is that they are all interconnected. So delivering a climate action may actually mean changes to the built environment, change to the farmed environment, changes to how people heat the buildings which they occupy. So there are all sorts of um, 
ways sitting underneath that headline climate action, which actually will refer potentially to all the various sectors globally. And I don't remember the stats, one of the others, um, and maybe you, Catherine, will know better than me, but the, the figures associated with the built environment globally, whether in construction or occupation, it accounts for something like a quarter of all global emissions. So there is a lot of action required, and particularly in construction, a lot of emissions associated with cement and steel particularly. So climate action doesn't mean that people aren't going to do anything about construction. It simply acts as kind of a headline catch-all and uh, some of the other topics sit beneath that. And I think, you know, some of the, the speakers earlier on today have been talking about things like reforesting and uh, the, the simple sort of tactical approach that we can take in our own gardens and our own sort of urban spaces and things to, to tackle some of this. Would you have any other guidance recommendations that you think any of us could adopt at a personal level to sort of take on some of these challenges? Yes, the, if, if, if we're thinking about climate change uh, and there are a number of a number of impacts associated with climate change I talked about flood and drought and there are plenty of others uh, and there are knock-on impacts in terms of ecosystem damage um, as, as habitats are lost or at least change as a consequence of climate change. The simplest actions which are available to us as private citizens which we can take straight away are fairly straightforward. Um, fly less or not at all if you can avoid it and clearly the last 12 months has has enforced that for many people. Drive less or travel more generally, use cars a lot less if you can. Heat your home slightly less and wear a jumper if it gets a little bit cold and eat less red meat and dairy. Those are the key things which we can all do in our own lives very readily, a change that we can all make today. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Audience, please, please join me in thanking Gavin Milligan today for joining us. Absolutely amazing and a phenomenal insight to a world that we probably just take for granted. We, you know, we take the products off the supermarket shelves and never give it another minute's thought. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. And thank you for the invitation.